My name is Marty Bolden, and I'm a person in long-term recovery. And for me, that means that I have not used alcohol or drugs since October 5th of 1987, and I've found my place in the world. And part of that place is about helping other people understand addiction and understand pathways out of addiction. And, and for me, that means that I have lots of conversations with people about the nature of addiction. And in listening to what people tell me during those conversations, what I start to notice is that whenever you bring up an issue around addiction, people tend to come back at you and reflect stereotypes about what they think addiction is. And so, for a second, if you think about what addiction is, you may find that images of crackheads and heroin addicts and closeted alcoholics and violent, you know, manic depressive people abusing pills may come to your mind. And, and what I would say to you is that those images aren't accurate and they're not really helpful. You know, if it was just that the information about addiction stigma was, you know, inaccurate and, and not important, I wouldn't be having this conversation today. But in the study that I'm doing right now and in the work that I'm doing uh, toward my PhD, I'm starting to collect stories about addiction stigma provided to me by people who, like me, are in long-term recovery. And so what I found out is that when we ask people about addiction stigma, they give us information that's a little bit disquieting. And, and one of the things that we need to understand is that there are people actually sober who will tell you in one moment that they have no experience of addiction stigma and in the next moment will tell you a story about how addiction stigma impacted their life. Stigma is not innocuous. It impacts the way people seek treatment. It impacts how long people stay in treatment. Addiction stigma even affects the professionals that work with people who suffer from substance misuse disorders. There is a great deal of science that indicates that uh, people who uh, are in law enforcement and healthcare professionals will actually retract from and work differently with somebody who they believe is suffering from addiction. Probably the most stunning fact is that communities that could use help from recovery services and treatment programs will resist the implementation of those programs in their community because they're not comfortable with the idea of having an out loud relationship with people seeking recovery. People like me. My own alcohol and drug use was not very <laughs> secretive. Um, it wasn't closeted and I want to put this out there for you because for the vast majority of people in America it is. But because my own abuse of alcohol and other drugs was so out loud and so public, my recovery wasn't public either, wasn't private either. Rather. And so when I first got sober, people would come to me and say, what happened? And I'd tell them about the fact that I started a path of recovery and I started a path in sobriety. And, and, and that conversation, if you know me, if you get to know me, it's hard to know me beyond hello and what's the weather without starting to understand how important recovery from addiction is to me and to the people around me, including my family. I am a newbie in New Hampshire. We moved here in 2001, and uh, and that was the uh, and that was the that was the the month we moved here in, in June of 2001. And my youngest daughter started kindergarten in in that September. And I remember uh, I remember you know in, in our family having lots of conversations and people in recovery are in my life and in and out of my home and. And one day I came home from work and my wife told me that a neighbor knocked on the door. And she answered the door and the neighbor said, are, are you okay? And my wife said, sure, what's up? And she said, well, your daughter Maddie is in kindergarten. She's telling everybody that your husband's an alcoholic and we were <laughs> worried about it. <laughs> and so my wife said, you know, our family addresses addiction out loud. And we also talk about a path of recovery out loud. So in some small way, the conversation I'm having with you today is a, it's a distillation of that conversation that started 13 years ago on a path towards a conference. But like I said, 
there are a lot of people that have a path of addiction and recovery that are like me, but there are some numbers that you really need to know. And the first one is 24 million. Today, as we sit here, 24 million Americans suffer from active substance misuse. What does that mean? That means one in 10 Americans, one in 10, Amer one in one in 10 Americans over the age of 12 has a problem with the way they use alcohol or other drugs. There are 200 people in this audience, 20 of us in this audience today have that problem. That's not the most important number. That 10% of the American adult population, that's not the important number. Here's the really important number. Of every 10 people who want treatment in America, there's only treatment available for one of them. So when people come to a place of knowing that they have a problem with addiction, there's nowhere for them to get help. And it's not that there's nowhere for them to get help. Sometimes the only places that they can get help are by becoming incarcerated and put in the criminal justice system. And so you can start to see how having a problem with addiction can really marginalize somebody's life. And if this was just about large numbers of people who have treatment or large numbers of people who don't have access to treatment, maybe we could look past that. But the reality is that in New Hampshire, Untreated, unfettered addiction costs you $1.84 billion annually. Let me put that number in perspective for you. The, the governor just passed a very arduous budget working with the House and the Senate for the state of New Hampshire. And the entire amount of money spent in the state of New Hampshire on all of our services over the course of a year is about $5.5 billion. So it takes five and a half billion dollars to run the state. And it costs the state every year $1.84 billion in lost labor, criminal justice costs, but the real giant is health care costs. And so I don't think it's an accident that a vast number of Americans suffer from addiction and that it's untreated. When I think about why that is the way it is, what I think about is that the whole country, pretty much it seems, the whole country, pretty much it seems, is in denial about addiction. And these stereotypes help us do it, right? When I see somebody who's like a crack whore, I can say, well, that's not me. When I see somebody crawling out of a refrigerator box or somebody who's homeless, I can say, that's not me, but remember, one in 10 adults have this problem, which means the vast majority of people who are misusing alcohol and other drugs are contributing. They're homeowners, they're family members, they're, they're people in society, they're people whose lives are negatively impacted by impairment, but they're not seeking help because their lifestyle, the way they look at themselves, does not match the stigma that is presented as the nature of addiction in America. I, uh, I had a great job. Before I got this fellowship, I had this phenomenal job. I was the director of a juvenile delinquency diversion program here in Manchester called the Office of Youth Services. And in that job, it was amazing to me because I got to interact with key stakeholders and elected officials and trusted public servants about addiction. And, and one of the things that would happen in those conversations is I would tell them things like, 10 years ago I told people the heroin epidemic was coming. And no one listened. And I said, you know, when this happens in New Hampshire, people who live in this state are barely going to recognize where they grew up. And nobody listened. And parents would come to me when I was at the Office of Youth Services and ask me to incarcerate their children because they couldn't get help for them anywhere else. And Matt, just think about that for a second. Think about what it would be like to have a child that has a treatable disease and the only way you can get them help is to have them put in jail. Would you do it? You know, when we think about the addiction stigma, when we think about those caricatures of what addiction looks like, what we really avoid is talking about the actual nature of addiction. 
So today, no extra charge, I'm going to unravel for you <laughs> the nature of addiction. Addiction isn't about how much a person uses, how often they use, what they use. It's not about whether or not they fit a stereotype. Addiction is about what happens to a person when they use alcohol and other drugs. I have a fundamentally different reaction to the use of alcohol than people who can socially use alcohol. And by the way, that's about four out of five people can socially use alcohol without consequence. I'm not one of them. The same way people with diabetes cannot use sugar without consequence. Right? And so for me, when I use alcohol or the drugs, I have this fundamentally different experience from it. And when I use it, the number one casualty in my life and the lives of most people I talk to is human relationships. When we read about stigma, we see people incarcerated or drugs or you know, people crawling out of homeless, mental, all these, these images. What we don't realize is that for everyday people, for the vast majority of people who suffer from addiction, it's measured in broken promises and unrequited love. It's measured by people being absent for the most important moments in their lives. The real nature of addiction is that it puts a person in a place of absolute existential isolation, where the ultimate casualty is their relationship with themselves. And so, for me, when I come to places like this, people want to hear about my using story. The, like, what did you do? How much did you do? Which one of these, which one of these stereotypes were you? And, and, and I understand that because, let's face it, that's the entryway that most people come into this conversation. They want to see how my experience fits against that. But if I started telling that story, what I'd stop doing is telling you the most important story. And that's that. There are people living in long-term recovery. There are a lot of us. You know, if I didn't come up here and tell you that I was a person in long-term recovery, let's face it, I've got a pretty good resume. I've done some neat things with my life. I don't match any of those stigmas, right? I'm a homeowner. I'm civically engaged. I vote. So I'm out there in the world, and unless I came out to you and I said, this is who I am and this is where I came from, most of you would never suspect that. But there are 23 million of me. There are 23 million people living in long-term recovery in the United States, and it is my research, or it's the idea of my research, that many of those people are not involved in public discourse on addiction remedy because of stigma, because of shame. You know, one of the interesting findings from my research is that talking to people in long-term recovery is that those people will come and they will start to tell me about how they have no problem with addiction stigma, but their bosses don't know they're in recovery. Their neighbors don't know that they're recovering. And what's tragic about that is that sometimes their bosses and neighbors have people in their lives who are suffering who have no idea how to get help. Because let's face it, the healthcare system isn't providing an adequate answer. You know, I'll tell you something about being a clinician. If you don't have a treatment to send somebody to, you stop diagnosing the problem that they're coming to you with. And so we see a lot of things that aren't, uh, we see a lot of things rather that our addiction is something else. And so what I'm here to, to talk about today is that, that if people in America can start recognizing that there are vast numbers of people in recovery, that hopefully those people can start to provide a local response to addiction problems that come up in their communities. Right? And, and the model for this are called, there's a model out there that's been tested scientifically, it works really well, they're called recovery centers. And recovery centers are based on peer-based counseling relationships where People in recovery help people who are seeking recovery learn how to live in their community. They're extremely inexpensive. They've been measured to be efficient and effective. And one of the things that they do is they elevate the recovery resource that exists in the community. I think that this would be a great idea to counterbalance the unfettered, untreated addiction that exists in America today. But there's a couple things we need to make it happen. 
One thing is we need people like me, people who are in long-term recovery, not all of us, not telling everybody, but we need more people like me to stand up and say, you know what? After addiction, I put together a good life too. And the second thing we need is we need the rest of you to stop looking at us like those stereotypes. You know, I guess what I would say to you in, in, in this conversation is that this place on this stage today is a place for me to connect with you. You all have ideas worth sharing too. And people that you need to connect with in the world and, and relate to. And I hope that this conversation today encourages you to leave here today and start to connect with other people around the idea of addiction remedy in America. I really do. And some of you are sitting there and saying, well, I'm afraid, or I don't know who to talk to, or I don't know how to connect, or I don't know where to go. And what I'm saying is that if you don't know where to go, if you don't know who to talk to, you can reach out to me. My name is Marty Bolden. I'm a person in long-term recovery.